Basically, what's happened here is that since February 22nd, 2014, uh, relations between the Russians and the Americans, which were not terribly good, but were okay beforehand, have gone down the toilet bowl. <laughs> and uh, as you know, in early March, the Russians took, the, took Crimea, the Crimean Peninsula, uh, from Ukraine, and they have been heavily involved in a conflict in eastern Ukraine. Uh, that is actually very dangerous. Uh, what's going on in eastern Ukraine today is a war by virtually all accounts, and it's a war that involves the Russians. And because the Americans are on the other side of the conflict and the West Europeans are on the other side of the conflict, in a very important way, this is the West against the Russians. We're not actually fighting with the Russians in Ukraine, but we've been talking about or hinting that we might uh, aid the Ukrainians. Uh, and uh, this is actually a very dangerous situation because the Russians have made it clear that they consider Ukraine to be a core strategic interest. And in effect, that means that what we're doing is presenting the Russians with an existential threat. Uh, and that is not a good thing because this is a country that has thousands of nuclear weapons. And as you know, when great powers get scared, uh, they often do wild and crazy things, as the United States has demonstrated since September 11th. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to share the panel with uh, Professor Mearsheimer. Uh, one thing uh, uh, um, Professor Mearsheimer did uh, correctly identify, the crisis in Ukraine right now is a war. It is a war. It, uh, the Ukrainian press, English language press, as of this morning, reports, uh, depending on which account you read, several soldiers killed, as many as 20 wounded within the preceding 24 hours. Today is uh, day 270 of what the, uh, the um, regime in Kiev refers to euphemistically as an anti-terrorist operation. 270 days of armed conflict in Europe. Um, I had occasion earlier, uh, about the time uh, Dr. Mearsheimer was speaking about uh, the, the change in, in government in February of last year in Kiev, uh, to categorize the crisis, I think quite in keeping with uh, what we all believe, is uh, you know, the fifth act in a tragedy uh, whose title is NATO expansion. So the question is, how did we get into this mess? Now, the conventional wisdom in the United States is that it's Putin's fault. And this is in large part because the United States never blames itself or its allies for any of the world's problems. It's always the other guy. Listening to Americans talk about foreign policy is like listening to my kids talk about who's responsible for their misdeeds. It's never their fault. It's always someone else's fault. This is how Americans talk about foreign policy. We never do anything wrong. Our ability to look in the mirror and see a true picture of ourselves is just non-existent. It's really quite remarkable. And, of course, in this situation, what we've decided to do is we've decided to blame Putin. This is not to say that Putin is a nice guy. This is not to say that Putin is not an autocrat. This is not to say that he's not a thug. This is simply to say that there's no evidence that he is bent on conquest. Uh, and the best evidence of that is that before February 22nd, that's when all the trouble started, February 22nd, 2014, you can find no evidence of American policymakers or European policymakers warning that he was about to go on a rampage and that we had to contain him. So this brings us to what's really going on here. The real reason that we have this crisis is that we are interested in peeling both Ukraine and Georgia away from Russia's orbit and making Ukraine and Georgia bulwarks of the West, right on Putin's doorstep. Uh, now, there are three parts to the strategy. The first part is NATO expansion. The second part is EU expansion. And the third part is the effort to promote democracy in places like Ukraine and Georgia. And when you talk about promoting democracy, what you're really talking about is putting in power leaders who are pro-Western and anti-Russian. Uh, in 1999, the, uh, in the, the first time in the post-Cold War era, 
the U.S. on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the foundation of its, uh, its military bloc, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, held for the first time a summit in the United States in Washington, D.C., which marks simultaneously not only the jubilee anniversary of NATO and the fact that a NATO summit was held in the United States. Keep in mind this is a military alliance that in theory uh, was to protect Europe from uh, you know, Soviet expansion, but it's held now you know, in Washington, D.C. in 1999 against the backdrop of the first uh, post-Cold War expansion of that treaty uh, organization where Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary were brought in. Right? So for the first time outside of Norway, we have a country that borders Russia brought into a U.S. dominated military alliance. Uh, at the same time, NATO is conducting its first war, a 79-day air war against the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. In the interim, the so-called North Atlantic Treaty Organization has conducted wars in three continents in Europe with Yugoslavia for 13 years in Afghanistan and Asia and against Libya four years ago in Africa. At its latest summit in Wales in the United Kingdom last year, in addition to representatives in the 28 full members of NATO, there are representatives in 49 partner countries. Do the arithmetic. That's 77 countries. That's well over a third, closer to a half of the, of the nations in the United Nations, members of the United Nations, belonging to a U.S.-led military bloc. Uh, when the Cold War ended, in informal discussions, uh, the United States, and especially the Germans, made it clear to the Russians that there would be no NATO expansion. It was never put in writing, but we now have all the memos of the meetings. They've been all declassified, and they're in the public record now, of what the West said to Gorbachev about NATO expansion. And we said there would be no NATO expansion. However, after the Clinton administration came to power, they became intoxicated with the idea of expanding NATO eastward. And there were two tranches, one in 1999, the other in 2004, that ended up incorporating countries like Poland, Hungary, and even the Baltic states in that second tranche into NATO. The Russians screamed bloody murder the entire time. But then, in April 2008, we had the famous NATO summit at Bucharest. And at the end of that summit, NATO said that Ukraine and Georgia would eventually become part of NATO. The Russians put their foot down and said that this is categorically unacceptable. It is no accident, ladies and gentlemen, that in August 2008, remember the Bucharest summits in April 2008, in August 2008, you had a war between Georgia and Russia. It was over this very issue. The Russians made it clear in August that there was no way that Georgia was going to become part of NATO. There was no way that Georgia was going to become a Western bulwark on their doorstep. Uh, Georgian websites, this was the, the period of the Mikhail Saakashvili uh, government in Tbilisi, uh, reproduce letters from, uh, at that time, senators, but also presidential candidates, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, John McCain, which are almost identical in phraseology. It was evident they came from a common source. They all entered, uh, ended with exactly a comment that I noticed uh, uh, Dr. Mearsheimer used in his article in Foreign Affairs, the catchphrase, Europe whole and free. And I think it's very important to realize the genesis of that expression, an al alternate version of which is Europe whole, free, and at peace. That is an Orwellian inversion of the truth, I can assure you, the, the, the addition of the third term. In uh, 1989, uh, President George, uh, 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 the first George Bush, made a statement in Mainz, Germany, and this is, uh, I believe, immediately before the collapse of the Berlin Wall and perhaps a year before German reunification. And the speech had that title, Europe whole and free. And it was clear that policymakers in, in the United States, but also their NATO allies uh, in Europe, were envisioning some sort of continental system in Europe. And that continental system, let's be real clear about this, there is not a single nation, European nation, including the island nations, with the exception of the micro-states like Andorra, Liechtenstein, Vatican, Monaco, that is, has not either, either been a full member of NATO or a member of the Partnership for Peace program, and in many instances, several intermediate programs. So what we're talking about is the entirety of Europe being subordinated to a military bloc controlled from the other side of the Atlantic, and nothing less. Second part of the strategy was EU expansion, right? And the idea here was that what you would do is you would slowly but steadily incorporate Ukraine 
into the European Union. You would get it integrated economically into the West. And this, of course, would help facilitate making Ukraine part of the West's orbit, not Russia's orbit. And then again, the third part of the strategy, as I pointed out to you, was to promote democracy, which was all about putting in power pro-Western leaders. Right? So it's these three strategies that was the background cause of the crisis. Now, what we want to know is what actually happened to precipitate the crisis on February 22nd of 2014. I gave you the background cause, which was this strategy to peel Ukraine away from Russia's orbit. But what caused the crisis on February 22nd? It goes back to the fall of 2013. In the fall of 2013, right, this is roughly four months before the February 22nd coup. Uh, the president of Ukraine, Yanukovych, President Yanukovych, who was flirting with the EU to put together an economic deal that would pull Ukraine closer to the West, closer to the EU, decided to deep six the deal. He decided the deal was unacceptable. And instead, he decided to cut a deal with Putin and the Russians. When this happened in late November of 2013, protests broke out in Ukraine against Yanukovych's decision. What Yanukovych did was very unpopular in the western part of Ukraine. And protests continued and they got more troublesome for Yanukovych over time. And eventually, we ended up in a situation where people were even killed at some of the protests. Okay? So this is one of the precipitating causes. On February 22nd, you had a coup in Ukraine where Yanukovych was overthrown by pro-Western forces, aided by the United States. The United States was backing this coup. How much the United States was backing this coup, we don't know at this point in time. But there is evidence that we were backing the coup. We were funding the opposition to Yanukovych. This is all part of our interest in promoting democracy. And what happened was, was Yanukovych was overthrown. This is a democratically elected government under Yanukovych. He was overthrown, and he was replaced by a pro-Western leadership. Immediately thereafter, the Russians took Crimea. This happened in early March. And then, almost simultaneously, conflict broke out in the eastern part of Ukraine where a large number of Russian speakers began to talk and act on the idea that they should become separate from Ukraine and maybe even integrate into Russia. Why did the Russians do this? The Russian response is highly, highly understandable. The idea that the Russians did something that should be difficult to understand from a Western point of view is something I don't get at all. The Russians made it clear that from a geostrategic point of view, it was categorically unacceptable for NATO to drive the alliance right up to its doorstep. Why we didn't understand this, I don't get. Mike McFall says that he kept telling the Russians, he kept telling Putin and Putin's lieutenants that this was not a threat to Russia. The Russians said, we don't believe that for one second. From our point of view, this is a threat. The idea that a military alliance that was our mortal enemy for 45 years can remain intact after the Cold War ends and that that military alliance can be driven right up to our border and we don't worry about it is not the way the world works. This is what they effectively said. But we kind of didn't get that. Now, if you want to know what's going on in eastern Ukraine, Putin is not bent on conquering Ukraine. He's not a fool. He knows what happened to the Soviet Union when it invaded Afghanistan. He knows what happened to the Americans when they invaded Afghanistan. Right? So he's not invading. 
what he's doing is he's wrecking Ukraine. He's destroying Ukraine as a functioning society. And he's saying, we have two choices here, right? Either the West backs off and I'll leave Ukraine alone, or you continue to try to make Ukraine part of the West, and I'll prevent that from happening by wrecking the country. That's what he's doing. He's wrecking the country. It's just very simple. Think about the United States of America. As almost all of you know, we have something called the Monroe Doctrine. And that means that we do not like distant great powers coming into the Western Hemisphere. Almost everybody in this room is old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. I certainly am. You remember how we went ballistic at the thought that the Soviets were deploying military forces in the Western Hemisphere? This was simply unacceptable. It's one of the reasons that we've had Castro in our gun sight for decades. He had the audacity to invite the Soviets to bring military forces into the Western Hemisphere. And then after the Cuban Missile Crisis, he and the Russians were talking about establishing a naval base, a Russian naval base at Cienfuegos. We told the Russians in no uncertain terms, this is not happening. This is our hemisphere. You're not allowed in here. That's what the Monroe Doctrine is all about. But whether you like the Monroe Doctrine or not, that's the way great power politics works. Great powers are very sensitive about their security. They are very sensitive about their neighborhood. The idea that they're going to allow another great power to come in to their neighborhood and march right up to their border, it's not going to happen. And this is what the Russians said. This is what Putin said. And we refuse to believe this. Uh, you know, along the lines of what uh, you know, Professor Mearsheimer was talking about, were one to uh, uh, you know, if turnabout is fair play, and if every nation of the Western Hemisphere was brought into a uh, Russian-dominated military bloc, I, I don't believe we would be paranoid in suspecting we were the likely target of that military expansion. And that's the same thing with Russia. But the, the association agreement of the Eastern Partnership with Ukraine, the rejection of which uh, triggered, uh, you know, the now 270-day war in that country, uh, contains, a, uh, it's, it's been ratified, now it contains a very strong military component. And it would effectively uh, uh, intensify the integration of Ukraine into Western military structures. We have to recall that in the 1990s, in addition to the Partnership for Peace, launched in 1994, uh, there, was all, there was also a NATO program called Mediterranean Dialogue, which takes in seven countries in North Africa and in the Middle East. There's, uh, as of uh, the summit in Chicago, the NATO summit of, in Chicago 2012, uh, a NATO partnership which I think has the most, um, you know, revealing title, Partners Across the Globe. In Afghanistan for 13 years under the, um, the structure of the International Security Assistance Force, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization managed to integrate military forces from 50 nations and every inhabited continent. This is unparalleled in history, as, as is any military bloc containing, you know, 77 members and partners and so forth. This is what we have to see as the backdrop. Uh, in his article, uh, Professor Mearsheimer talked about the Eastern Partnership Program, which is vital to understand because this is the real precipitant for the crisis in Ukraine, the immediate precipitant. In 2008, uh, Sweden and Poland, and we're talking about foreign minister at that time in Sweden, Karl Bildt, foreign minister at that time of Poland, uh, Radoslaw Sikorski, who had lived in the United States, is married to an American journalist, worked for the Heritage Foundation and so forth, uh, crafted the Eastern Partnership, which was meant transparently to uh, wean from the Commonwealth of Independent States, that is the essentially economic bloc that was thrown as a sop to Russia after the fragmentation of the Soviet Union, was meant, and it, it, it targeted uh, all the former Soviet uh, federal republics, excepting the Baltic states, which by that time had already joined both NATO and the European Union, and Russia itself, uh, excluding the five Central Asian uh, former Soviet republics for whom the EU has a comparable or an analogous program. But these countries that are targeted by the Eastern Partnership are uh, Belarus, Armenia, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Azerbaijan, uh, those, those six. All at that time, well, all uh, formerly were members of the Commonwealth of Independent States. Georgia withdrew from that bloc after the uh, August uh, 2008 war with uh, Russia. But what the European partnership effectively would do is to destroy any autonomous post-Soviet 
uh, organizations within former Soviet space. It would, have, it, uh, it would supplant uh, for the Commonwealth of Independent States the European Union. It was in November of 2013 when the Yanukovych government, I don't know that they so much scrapped what was called an association agreement with the European Union under the auspices of the Eastern Partnership as they simply postponed uh, you know, uh, formalizing that relationship, which was rectified in due order after the coup in Kiev, you can be assured. And then what happened was a series of protests, which res uh, it resulted not only in the deaths of protesters, let's recollect, but in, in the deaths of 12 or s to 16 police officers who were killed. Uh, one can only imagine how a situation of that sort would, have been, would be handled had it occurred in Washington, D.C., rather than Kiev in the Ukraine. When I mentioned that Ukraine has never been fully neutral, let me uh, uh, explain what that is. Though anything uh, short of evidently 100% loyalty uh, is, you know, is not to be tolerated. The, uh, crap, the uh, uh, Kuzma government, Leon, Leon de Kuzma government, that is three governments removed right now, supplied almost 1,700 troops to the George W. Bush administration for the occupation of Iraq after the invasion in 2003 under what was called Multinational Forces Iraq, which was assisted by NATO. This was a goodwill gesture or a token of uh, uh, commitment, if you will, uh, for NATO integration. Subsequently, you know, this, this very same government we now uh, derogate and condemn, uh, the Yanukovych government, became the first non-NATO power to supply uh, a naval vessel for NATO's now permanent uh, uh, interdiction and surveillance operation in the Mediterranean Sea, Operation Active Endeavor. It then uh, followed that up by being the first non-NATO country to supply a ship for NATO's permanent uh, uh, naval operation in the, uh, off the Horn of Africa in the Arabian Sea, Operation Desert Shield. Up until the uh, change in the regime uh, 11 months ago in Ukraine, NATO, uh, Ukraine was to have been one of four non-NATO countries to supply military uh, personnel and equipment for NATO's response force, that is its international strike force in essence. The others were, revealingly, Georgia, uh, Finland, and Sweden. So we see that, you know, far from Yanukovych, uh, you know, the Yanukovych government uh, in any way being hostile to NATO, he seemed, in my estimate, to be a completely uh, uh, and unjustifiably uh, accommodating to NATO. So uh, a couple things I think we have to keep in mind here is that, uh, and let me just, uh, because I, I know I've heard from people, I was on a, a Russian debate with uh, Michael Hanlon from the Brookings Institution who accused me of uh, gross and unconscionable exaggeration in terms of NATO buildup in, in uh, Eastern Europe uh, since the crisis in Ukraine ensued. And he was talking about, you know, minor, you know, military drills and so forth. Uh, in March of last year, in last year's iteration of a NATO exercise uh, called Cold Response, it was held in the Arctic Circle, roughly 200 miles from Russian territory. It included over 16,000 troops from 16 nations, including Sweden and Finland. And again, you know, along the lines of the, uh, you know, the allegory that uh, Dr. Mearsheimer mentioned, uh, not to worry, right? I mean, there's no reason for Russia to be concerned about 16,000 troops in, in major war games uh, a couple of hundred miles from their border. Uh, I, I believe it's incumbent on us, first of all, to realize that the, the I'm, I'm afraid at this point, intractable. I, I would like to believe the formula that was offered earlier, wise as it is, you know, will be acted upon and we can retreat from what is, uh, you know, potentially a very dangerous confrontation. Um, I should let you know that both of us uh, panelists objected to the original title that was proposed for this talk, which included uh, words to the effect of, you know, nuclear war or something. However, I woke up this morning to see somebody not noted for ever having been, uh, you know, tremendously confrontational with the West, former Soviet President uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, talk about just that prospect. I don't know if anyone saw that today. We talked about the crisis potentially, you know, ha which had the potential to spin out of control and eventually lead to a, a nuclear war. So uh, I don't believe that's a distinct prospect, but it's, it, it, we shouldn't even discuss the, you know, the uh, percentages on that one. Uh, this is something that is fraught with that potential. It's dangerous beyond all comprehension. We need to step back. We need rationality. I'll go a step further, though, in my proposal. We not only need to call for immediate halt to uh, NATO expansion, we need to call for the abolition of the North Atlantic Treaty organization, which I consider the biggest threat to world peace.